elephant in the room, the Game Awards happened. That's a, that's a thing that occurred. I've been surprised actually at the somewhat negative response to the Game Awards. Like I've always thought it was well known <laughs> that the Game Awards was basically just one big series of commercials and that's it. But for some reason, it's like surprising everybody. Everybody's like, wait, like the awards are an afterthought and, and the the ads are the focus? What? And everybody's shocked. And then it's so corporate too. Like they have all of these movie stars and actors coming up to do stuff. Game of the Year was announced by Wish.com Willy Wonka for some reason. I don't understand. Like the whole thing is just bizarre and... Um, some Xbox controller modder who has a tiny YouTube channel. That's funny. Uh, so it's just other than Monster Hunter Wilds being announced, but still being like a year and a half away, there wasn't a whole lot for me to be like, oh, wow, that was, that was awesome. I know some people are pumped about Blade, but it's a cinematic trailer. That's it. We saw some more stuff with Suicide Squad, which I guess is fresh to you if you didn't get into the closed alpha, allegedly. So I guess that's a thing. Flute guy was there. That's true. So I guess that's good. I don't know. There just wasn't a whole lot. The The Black Myth Wukong trailer looked really good. I'll give him that. This was probably the worst, like the single worst trailer I've ever seen in my life. We've seen some bad trailers. I thought the Hellblade 2 trailer was pretty horrible. This thing, like... This is supposedly uh, supposedly a trailer for a game that breaks genres and industries and media types. Like this is supposedly a game that's going to shake the world. And they decided to do like a tech demo face capture thing, which looks identical to the stuff they did way back when with like LA Noir behind the scenes. Let me see if I can find the those clips. Yeah, like these. This was basically their trailer for their cutting edge game was just this. They just filmed this and we're like, yeah, that's a good trailer. And then everybody gives Kojima a standing ovation. I genuinely don't understand it. It's just odd. I don't get it. It will get voted best because it's a Hideo Kojima game. Well, I, I think that there's sort of a, a, a swing back effect right now, a pendulous motion within some of the gaming industry where everybody's aware that there's some extremely awkward bias with Jeff Keighley. We all joke about his bromance with Kojima, but like, you know, we have tweets that are going out and going like semi-viral because it's like, yeah, know the Game Awards rules. OD comes out. It's the worst trailer I've ever seen, except he's like, oh yeah, no, take whatever time you need. We're gonna have you and Jordan Peele come out and stand on stage for 10 minutes saying basically nothing. And then we're going to like, once Alan Wake wins awards, yeah, wrap it up, which this is a, this is gonna be a meme now, um, was the teleprompter. After about 30 seconds for all of the awards, a big please wrap it up thing would go up and then they'd start playing music to walk people off the stage because they needed to cram as many ads in as they could. And I get it, they didn't want a Christopher Judge situation. If you don't remember that last year, he did like an eight minute speech and it was like one of the first things to happen in the show. So it threw the whole thing off, but I don't think this was a great way of doing it. Like Larry and one game of the year and they got rushed off the stage as they're like saying thank you to a deceased member of the, I think cinematic team. It was like the lead cinematic designer. They're like, we want to dedicate this to you, my friend, rest in peace. And then they're like starting the music, please finish up, hurry along. Like, it's just bizarre. But I mean, that's what it is. It's a, it's a show. They have to keep it on schedule and pump it out. But it just reaffirmed for a lot of people that this was not about actually giving out awards and giving those people the time to say thank you to those who made it possible. It's about shoving as many commercials into a three and a half hour show or three hour show, whatever it was, as they can. And it's just weird. And there were a lot of trailers. I'll give them that. There were a lot of announcements and things. One of the things that was perhaps, I mean, I, we had heard rumblings about this, but we hadn't actually seen it. The new game coming from Hello Games, which if you missed it, this was basically a trailer for what they said, I forget exactly how he phrased it, but it was basically No Man's Sky, but 
in reverse. No Man's Sky is a series of stars and galaxies. And it's basically a universe a sim where you can go to all of these planets that are procedurally generated, but each of the planets are pretty small and they're each kind of each individual planet is a biome and that's it. But for the last five years, apparently they've been working on this project that is the opposite in a way where it's a singular planet. He said like the size of Earth or larger, so probably larger than the planet Earth, but that all players can go to and play on all at the same time. And each each of the, the areas on the planet are like its own microbiome. And so you can go and the size of the planet, like the actual planet, Hold on, the bitrate is really low. Oh, I bet it's because they just straight up took this from the stream. Yeah, GameSpot's got it. I think IGN just straight up recorded the stream and then uploaded that. GameSpot looks like they have the actual trailer. But it's a cool idea. It's very ambitious. But again, like just like we saw in No Man's Sky, this is allegedly being developed by like 12 people. Okay, <laughs> so like don't expect actual magic. I will say they've learned a lot. And I think that they've shown with No Man's Sky, they know how to build upon a foundation and help it grow. But this is something I would expect launches and it's pretty boring. And then over the course of like five years with tons of expansions, it gets to the point where it's really cool. But uh, at the outset, it's like, oh, that's a cool technological feat. I don't know how that makes for a really fun video game, but I'm open to it. I'm interested because I mean, they are actual, like what he said in the show was their actual mountain sized mountains, miles high, not video game mountains where it's like a couple hundred meters up. They're basically just big hills, but actual mountains. I will say this does have the no man's sky patented rock pop in. If you haven't played no man's sky, you might not be familiar with it, but just like watch this field over here. You'll see the boulders load in. Yeah, see, all those. That's classic No Man's Sky. But it's an actual planet-sized map. At least that's what they're talking about. So that was at least interesting and a little novel and different. It's called Light No Fire. And as for when we see it or hear about it, who knows? Who knows? I have, I have no idea. Other than that, uh, we didn't get a Death Stranding 2 trailer. Chadwick, thank you for the 499. Like to see your praise of Cyberpunk 2077. Never had, never had a game hit me like it does. Uh, yeah, I mean, they've... The fact that we thought it was done and it was already really, really impressive what they had done and then we got even more is even crazier. Jurassic Park Survival? No, not talked about that either. Um, let me pull that up in another tab too and we can touch on that because that was one that I actually... That was a surprise. So this is... Senua's Saga Hellblade 2. And this place of fear and fury. As of like so far, we've only really seen cinematic stuff. We haven't seen actual gameplay. The heartbeat of the lost ones. But that changes here. It's graphically very, very impressive. I don't think it looks as impressive today as it did when they first showed it off. But that's mainly just because we've seen some other really, really amazing stuff come out. But we saw actual gameplay. It looks like your standard Hellblade combat, really punchy, but not overly complicated. Mostly about, you know, maybe a light heavy attack and then some parries. It doesn't look like they've done a whole lot other than new animations and stuff like that for parrying stuff. But it looks like it's probably going to be Hellblade like we got last time, but just with some knobs cranked. And that's good enough for me. Um, it's a cinematic experience first and foremost, and that's what they seem to be able to deliver. This is one to keep an eye on. And as they show more, I mean, there's just tons of wacky, crazy stuff, but they gave it a 2024 release date, probably holiday. Xbox's goal is to have one release every quarter, like one big release every quarter, and this would be one of them. So I would guess that this probably slides into that fall or winter slot, which I think is a good spot for it. Doesn't this look like a game you want to just curl up on the couch and play? You know, just curl up on the couch. Nice and cozy. Yeah, the, the video compression doesn't do it justice. The texture quality is crazy. That is apparently coming next year as well. So that was cool to see. The other one that was very surprising was also this Jurassic Park survival. 
I don't deny it. Um, they didn't hold out very long. They were just like, yep, here's the theme music. There's that. It's all pre-rendered cinematic, so they put that on the text, pre-rendered footage, you see. So none of this is actually running real time or anything. But I mean, once you ignore all that, it's like, okay, they're setting the tone. You're escaping dinosaurs. Okay, I get it. This was a really cool moment. She runs out and then collapses. This was cool. Isn't that awesome? I think that's pretty cool. I'll mute it so we don't get copyright struck. And then they show some gameplay. At first I thought this was like a VR game, but I don't think it is. You know, I'm, I'm open to it. I don't know if this is just like a straight survival game or if this is going to be like a multiplayer survival game or what they're trying to do, but it's next gen. It's coming from Saber. I'm I'm open to it. I wanna I wanna see more for sure. So one of the biggest surprises for me, the announcement of a free DLC for God of War, not at all what we thought it was going to be though. There's been rumors about a God of War DLC for a long time, especially because the way that they like wrapped up the story seemed really, really to set it up for another smaller story specifically with like Atreus going off and then you play as him and they built out all these different move systems and stuff for him. So it seemed like they were going to do it, but then we got this, which is a trailer for a roguelike. How exactly do they describe it? it Valhalla is an action packed expansion with roguelike elements only on PS five and PS four December 12th. So, I thought maybe they were taking some extra time working on it to like prep it for next gen hardware or really crank the the knobs but nope it's coming to last gen as well and it seems like it's probably just a series of combat encounters very similar to what we had in uh was it Niflheim in the first game but now maybe with some some actual like story elements woven through it and you know, you can see they have like little cutscenes of of Kratos waking up. So maybe they're doing something like that. Dude, all of these IGN trailers are just taken straight from the stream. There's not actual like footage, so it looks terrible. Yeah, this is better at least. I, I don't know. Honestly, I was expecting when I heard about an expansion for God of War, I was going to be pumped. But frankly, right now, like it's free, so I can't be that bummed, but I'm really underwhelmed by this. I was hoping we would get like a big Atreus thing or something, but it's a free update. Can't be that mad about it, but I'm not big into these like roguelike modes that they tack on to games. Um, even if they're just meant for grinding out gear and stuff, I just, I don't know. I don't know. It's just not for me. It's not for me. So when I saw it, I was like, Oh, okay. Jared, Luke, what are your thoughts on Spider-Man getting zero awards? Honestly, everything it was nominated for, I, I just frankly think there were other games that did those things better. Like people, I saw people freaking out because they were like, oh, well, did you see that Yuri Lowenthal didn't win best performance? And I'm like, yeah, I didn't think his performance was the best of the year either. <laughs> like, was it deserving of a nod or like a nomination? Sure, whatever, but like, I, I just think it's, it's, believe it or not, it is possible that sometimes games can, or, or games can be nominated or actors can be nominated and they, they just don't come out uh, on top compared to the competition. Mudahar had a funny take because this guy posted this tweet, was really upset about it. And it's like, Baldur's Gate 3 winning game of the year over this is crazy. I'm like, okay, you picked a cinematic moment from the opening of the game. Spoiler alert, nothing this cool happens for the rest of the game. <laughs> In terms of like showing off the PS5 SSD, this is far and away like the biggest moment. Um, but beyond that, they also said something really funny. And I'm going to say, I love Baldur's Gate 3. It's my game of the year. I love it dearly. This is, I think, hilarious though. <laughs> Like, come on, that is, that's a little funny. Okay, I'll give you that. That's a little funny. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's, okay. So 
this guy was very upset about Spider-Man not winning game of the year. And Mudahar was just like, yeah, because it's a better game, lol. <laughs> and it's just... I, I don't think Spider-Man 2 was like a bad game. It's just, it came out in a year with some generation-defining games that were just shockingly good. And those games got the awards over Spider-Man, which was a comparatively very safe sequel that didn't do anything that crazy um, in comparison. Like, Baldur's Gate 3 will be talked about for 20 years as people keep pointing back to it as the standard of what these RPG games can be. And Spider-Man 2, I think, is just going to be tossed into, oh yeah, it was another Sony exclusive third-person adventure game. So there was that. <laughs> um, people pretty upset about Spider-Man. I, I don't think it's that outrageous. I think it was pretty predictable that it wouldn't wouldn't beat it out. Oh yeah, Skull and Bones deep dive trailer. I am hopeful. I can't say anything too specific, but I'm hopeful that I get my hands on Skull and Bones relatively soon. And if I do get my hands on the game relatively soon, we might just do that on stream. And then you guys can see what the game is actually like in real time. Xbox took home a few dubs. I mean, they announced, well, there was one really weird thing. They did announce some big stuff that I think at least show that they were present, which is more than I think could be said last year. I mean, like last year and honestly, a few years before that, they just never, excuse me, as I belch, they never could really get their feet under them. And what was kind of odd is like they announced this Blade game, which is their big Marvel title coming from Arcane Leon. And... It, it seems interesting, but they also have not said clearly that it's an exclusive. They didn't put the Xbox branding on it. They didn't do any of that. So it makes you wonder, did Marvel require them to make it multi-platform? little surprising. They still like won't really talk about it. Yeah, Xbox Wire simply links to a story about the announcement on Bethesda Net, which also doesn't include any specific mentions of Xbox in it. You can contrast this with the Bethesda Net story that followed the announcement of Redfall back in 2021, which features multiple mentions that not just that the game was uh, on was an Xbox Series X and S X and PC exclusive, but also that it would be coming to Game Pass day one. They reached out to Bethesda in order to ask if Blade was an Xbox console exclusive, and they declined to comment. Xbox owns Arcane, their last game from another team uh, under their umbrella, but their last game, Redfall, was an exclusive coming to Game Pass Day 1. But with this one, they're not just, like, not mentioning it. They're declining to comment. Is it not really weird? Like, it's just strange to me. It's very strange. I can't think of a, an example of another game that's been announced like this where they just refuse to say specifically what it actually is. And so, like, maybe it's still being negotiated. Maybe. I don't think at this point. Like, I think it's negotiated before they sign the paperwork um, to give them the rights to make it. And I don't think Arcane would take on this huge multi-million dollar project if it was still up in the air as to whether it gets released in a profitable way. So, I don't know. My guess, based on this reaction, it could be that Marvel is just saying, hey, we don't think that Xbox has enough users to justify putting this exclusively on your platform with the payout. So, we want cross-platform we want it to come out on playstation 5 or maybe release it on xbox and bring it to playstation 5 later or something I, I don't know but it's very weird that they aren't being specific it's very very strange very strange because you would think if it was exclusive to xbox they would just say that like just say it oh yeah we didn't put it in the trailer because we just didn't but uh yeah it's game pass day one and it's xbox exclusive they're not doing that they're intentionally declining to say it, which is weird. Let's see, Chadwick also, thank you for, for the uh, 499. Don't forget, Capcom hasn't released anything on Pragmata in a while. Capcom has a lot of irons in the fire, I think. I think they got a lot of stuff uh, coming. Spec Ops, thank you for the 20. Gee whiz, thank you. Very generous. Good to see you, my friend. Um, I'm surprised people are surprised it would be any different than any other award show. They're all shit unless Ricky Gervais is hosting. Yeah, 
I mean, my frustration with Jeff Keighley, the almighty Dorito Pope, Dorito Pope's in chat, everybody, is just that I think he has done a really good job of making the gaming industry much more mainstream. And he tries very hard to do that because he got started in like TV and journalism in that sect. And so he brought a lot of that expertise and those connections over to the gaming space. And I think it's been really good for the gaming industry on the whole. But the downside is that he... The reason he's like a multimillionaire is because he knows how to get all these ads, stuff them in, and then get this company to pay me to promote this mobile game. And then we'll get Epic to pay me to put the Lego Fortnite thing in the, the trailer and we'll I'll splice it in here. And he's very, very good at that. But the tale of the game awards has always been that it just doesn't they can't ever figure out the right way to balance it because either there's way too much music and just random bands playing music no one's ever heard of and never will look up because it's not that great, or they have a bunch of strange Hollywood tie-ins. And that's the thing that like frustrated me. I went to E3 2019 and I was at this panel in the audience, like, I don't know, uh, maybe like 40, 50 feet away from these guys. And what was really strange is like just before this, um, a panel or two before, Troy Baker had hosted the panel. Yeah, you can see I, <laughs> my old video on, on Todd. I was blown away at how good Troy Baker was at hosting a panel. Shocker, I mean, he's a performer, but he was able to just tie all these people in, keep them engaged, kind of command the stage and the space. And he made it very enjoyable to sit through some of these panels with people that were otherwise pretty socially awkward. Jeff Keighley is no better. I mean, the thing is, we always joke that it looks like he's dropped his charisma <laughs> and his stage presence. Because he's constantly like staring at the floor. he He's very, very awkward on stage. And every time there's an opportunity to meet a celebrity, he pushes everybody else aside so that he can be the one to meet him. And it kind of started to feel, especially after this, that this was basically just one big excuse for him to meet rich and famous people. And that's what he, like the Game Awards has kind of turned into as well. He just sees the opportunity to bring on whoever he can manage to uh, from Hollywood that might be famous or rich and then has them come on and he gets to meet them take pictures and stuff and then move on like it, it it's not about what makes the best show it's about what allows Jeff to get the big paycheck and to meet the famous people and that for me is is kind of frustrating because it's like, if you really want the industry to continue growing and improving, I think you should prioritize what's best for the industry and the game awards, which honestly is to hire a host like a Troy Baker, you know, maybe make fun of him for the NFT thing, but hire like a Troy Baker or get like a PewDiePie or somebody to come on, host the awards, just like the Oscars or anything else. They can poke fun at all the, the cringe stuff going on. But do that, let the performers and the people that specialize in presenting and being in front of an audience do that. And then Jeff can be in the background doing what he does best, still getting the big paycheck. But that's the thing is Jeff, I don't think really cares about what's best for the show. He just wants to make sure that he gets to meet the rich and famous people. And one of the best ways of, of demonstrating it is just watch. You probably noticed it at the Game Awards, but if you go through the Game Awards, just listen for all the times when Jeff randomly interjects that he's already seen it or he's already played this game or he went out and met the studio last year. Like all over the place, there were constant reveals where it has nothing to do with anything, but he'll just quickly be like, yeah, and I got to play this game last year and this game's really special. Tell us about it. It's like, no one cares, Jeff. Just like nobody's coming for you for your gaming opinions. Uh, like uh, unless it has to do with how much XP they can save on, on, uh, <laughs> you know, Halo if they buy a certain bag of Doritos, which again, if nobody knows that, it goes back to the almighty Dorito Pope incident um, where the one and only Jeff Keeley did like this sponsored segment covered in Doritos and Mountain Dew and stuff. And so people started calling him the Dorito Pope, <laughs> which is really funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's just funny it's just funny <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, i'm not professional enough for this but like 
that's because that's what Jeff's really good at. So I'm just like, let, let Jeff hang out with, with Kojima. They can talk about Doritos together, do that. And we'll just, we'll just leave it there. Like let the professionals do the presenting. That's what we need. Suck that Timothy presented game of the year. Shouldn't have been a person from the game industry. I know, right? Why did they have wish.com Willy Wonka presenting game of the year? I don't understand it. It like, it, again, it's just another instance where Jeff is just like, who is the most rich and famous person that we can figure out to get with? You know, like if, if Jeff can get next to Yi, he'll do that. Or yeah, whatever his name is now. He took my thing.